set up. I'm going to start now as we have uh, missed some valuable time with you. Um, as I said earlier, um, I am Tiff Roberts. Um, I am a senior, that's good. You're looking at, you were looking at us momentarily. You're looking back in the other direction now. Uh, my name is Tiff Roberts. I'm a senior I fellow here. At, there we go, there we go, here at the University of Montana. Um, thank you for joining our first Mansfield Dialogue of 2023, the down balloon, Chinese espionage, and the future of US-China relations and Indo-Pacific security. I am delighted and honored and very pleased that we finally have you here, uh, Dr. Dreyer. Um, Dr. June Teufel Dreyer is a professor of political science at the University of Miami, Coral Gables, Florida. Formerly, she was a senior Far East specialist at the Library of Congress, served as Asia policy advisor to the chief of naval operations, and was a commissioner of the United States China Economic and Security Review Commission, which is established by the US Congress. Uh, a graduate of Wellesley College and Harvard University, uh, she has lectured to analysts at the National Security Agency, as well as to the US Joint Security Operations Command. She is the author of Middle Kingdom and Empire of the Rising Sun, Sino-Japanese Relations in Historical Perspective, which received the prestigious Japan Institute for National Fundamentals 2017 prize for best book of the year. She is co-editor of Taiwan under Tsai Ing-wen and the 11th edition of her book, China's Political System, Modernization and Tradition will be coming out shortly. Her current research focuses on Sino-Japanese relations, Chinese domestic and foreign policy, Taiwan studies, and Indo-Pacific security studies. Uh, before I hand it over to Dr. Dreyer, I would like to point out that we'll have time for questions after we have a moderated discussion with Dr. Dreyer. Um, we will try to uh, incorporate any previously submitted questions, um, as well as you have the opportunity to post questions in the Q&A uh, in the Zoom. Uh, Dr. Dreyer, the, the floor is yours. Thank you. Well, I'm so happy to see you all after, I mean, I would have been happy anyway, but particularly after this uh, technical uh, brouhaha. So I've been asked to speak about the, of course, what I, what I call balloon gate and the associated uh, uh, fallout to Sino-American relations. And uh, this simply couldn't have happened at a worse time. Secretary of State Anthony Blinken was raring to go to a trip which was supposed to help thaw very frigid Sino-American relations when all of a sudden a huge balloon appears over the skies of Montana. And I can't help wondering, had it not been for the good citizens of Montana with their cameras, if we never would have found out about this because it subsequently devolves that there have been other sightings of balloons that we didn't hear about. And the Chinese government says, first of all, uh, we don't know anything about it. And second, then they revise that and they say it was a weather balloon that just went out of control. And the United States military says, no, it is not a weather balloon that just went out of control because it has extremely sensitive sensors on it and it was moving under its own power. And furthermore, it seemed to be suspiciously loitering over sensitive sites like missile bases and Air Force installations, many of which are in fact in Montana. And then eventually it uh, goes to where the administration thinks it is safe to destroy the uh, balloon, which it does. And with a lot of caricatures on both sides, uh, I found a wonderful one from the Chinese press, the Chinese cartoonist. And could you get that up on the screen? So this is from the Chinese press. 
I proudly present to you F-22, the balloon killer. And so they had a lot of, of laughs that we, we took us a, what, $120,000 missile to bring down one balloon. But of course, it's a very sensitive balloon. And fortunately for us, it went down in fairly shallow water. So you saw photographs of United States Navy people with the re retreated pieces of the balloon. And we may or may not find out. I hope somebody in the national security apparatus finds out what was in there and chooses to tell us. And then uh, Blinken cancels his trip. And there's a lot of speculation going on. And then all of a sudden, rapidly, three days in a row, we find three other objects. And the balloon was very definitely from China. The origin of the three other entities, which have been described as approximately the size of a small car, those have not been associated with a country, but they were also brought down. One of them over Alaska, the second one over the Yukon area of Canada, and the third one over Huron, Lake Huron. So uh, again, we should be getting information on those. But again, the tendency is not to want to talk about this. Biden's enemies have criticized him for indecisiveness. Uh, other people have criticized him for overreacting and shooting it down. So we are very much in the dark about what goes on here. And I think both sides would like to minimize this, but nonetheless, you can't help speculating on what the Dickens is going on here. Did Xi Jinping order this? And uh, we know that since taking over in, actually it was late 2012, confirmed as president in 2013, but it was 2012 party secretary that really mattered. He has taken control of virtually everything. The Chinese bureaucracy was known for overlapping functions, people, the right hand doesn't know what the left hand is doing in colloquial parlance. And so before that, you could say, well, it was just an accident. But with Xi Jinping having taken control of virtually everything, the Chinese tease about that, that he's the commander of absolutely everything, it gets harder to believe he didn't know. Now, there's been other speculation that he gave the a generalized okay to the People's Liberation Army, which is the entity that fielded this, actually specifically the strategic support force of the People's Liberation Army. And he gave them a general okay. But since they had done this before and gotten away with it, the, uh, they did it again and they thought they were gonna get away with it again. So somebody there wasn't thinking. We know that people in the military, like people in every other part of every part of life, make mistakes. In the case of the military, the great Prussian military strategist Karl von Clausewitz said it 150 years ago, you have to expect the unexpected. So, okay, it was the unexpected. The balloon went down where people in Montana could see it. They took pictures. After they took pictures, it was impossible for the United States government to pretend nothing happened. So they have to do something. And then they say, okay, we've actually known about this, these balloons for quite some time. And so the next question is to the, the administration, how come you didn't do anything about it? And the answer then is, well, we weren't sure what they were. And the answer is that once this big balloon, the one that was downed last week, was detected, we used, in quotation marks, other means at our disposal. Uh, and we realized they were balloons. Okay, 
you may want to believe that, and some people do, and you may not want to believe that, which more people do. And so that's where we are at the moment. And I know that there have been various odd things said, mostly by people who shouldn't be talking. Uh, Dr. Roberts, I know as an expert on China, you lived in Beijing for at least two years, is that right? A few decades. A few decades, my gosh. Uh, okay, well, there is a famous Chinese saying, those who know don't talk. Those who talk don't know. You know, with 5,000 years of history, the Chinese have come up with a four character saying for almost everything. And this I think is very apropos for this situation. So some people must know what's going on, but they are definitely not talking. So where are we at the moment? And uh, we have known about this, we're not talking about it. I can think actually of a good reason for the US government not to want to talk about it. And that is that by monitoring these balloons, they are gathering certain information about the technology that the Chinese have. And once the Chinese know that they're being, they're caught, they won't have that information anymore. And I got this from a military retired Navy guy, Naval intelligence guy, and he said, most of these balloons, and it wasn't clear whether he was talking about American balloons or Chinese balloons, they have a kill switch in them. So as soon as the operator of the balloon realizes that they have been detected, they will operate, they, they will activate the kill switch and all the data will go away. Now, some of it they presumably already got and that won't go away. But anyway, you hear people saying, well, what's the big deal? It's only a balloon. And that's a ridiculous statement. I was going to say something stronger, but this is a public forum. And it's not, you know, when is a balloon not just a balloon? And somehow saying, well, it's just a balloon seems to relegate it to the things that you buy for your kids' birthday parties. And obviously if it's the size of three school buses and it contains sensitive equipment on it, it's more than something for a kid's birthday party, okay? And then another thing I've heard is, well, it is, um, what's the big deal? Because we spy on them and they spy on us. And this is like saying some people are thieves and other people are thieves. What's the big deal? The difference is you get caught. <laughs> and if you get caught, there are going to be consequences. Okay. Now, we can't take China to jail over this, but we can turn up the heat. Uh, let's see, what else can I say? What's the way forward on this? And this is just my opinion. I have no inside information. What people are going to say on both sides is that the Sino-American relationship is too important to let it go over Balloon Gate. Whether you think it's important, and I do, or not. Uh, oh, one more thing I've heard, and that is it doesn't really matter because any information the Chinese wanted, they could get from their spy satellites. So it couldn't be much more than just a balloon. Again, that's a very ignorant response. The advantage of using the balloon as opposed to the satellite is that the satellite goes over quickly in a geosynchronous orbit. And the advantage of the balloon is it can fly much lower and it can loiter. So that's the reason for using a balloon because you have to ask them yourself, if their satellites are so good, why do they send the balloons in the first place? 
And the other issue here is international law. And the Chinese are, I guess, like most countries, they will use international law when it's to their advantage to do so and scoff at international law when it's not. In this case, however, there is international law and there is what is known as sovereign airspace. And this balloon was definitely in United States sovereign airspace. Now, the latest Chinese counter charge is that United States balloons have invaded Chinese airspace at least 10 times in the last couple of years. And unfortunately, they haven't specified what airspace they're talking about because the Chinese claim huge swaths of territory inside the South China Sea, something like 80% of the South China Sea, as their own territory. And the United States and the Philippines and Vietnam and Taiwan and a couple of other countries say, no, the entities in there belong to us. Or the entities in there belong to nobody. But in the case of the United States, what we want is a free and open Pacific. And so if the United States was flying balloons or satellites or whatever, airplanes, it's usually into those areas, which international law does not recognize as China's territorial waters, then that's okay. If, however, it was sending balloons over China, that would not be okay. But again, why didn't the Chinese say so earlier? So we're left with more questions than answers and no guarantee we're going to get answers anytime soon. So again, I think this is going to be soothed over. Um, Blinken, some people have reported that Blinken canceled his trip. He actually postponed the trip. Oh, by the way, in an earlier iteration, the Chinese were saying we never invited Bar uh, Blinken. He was coming on his own. And that's another absurdity. High level visits like that don't happen because one day you think, okay, it would be fun to visit Beijing. I've got a passport, off I go. These things are heavily scheduled and stilted. There would have been a band waiting at the airport. There would have been a hotel reservation. And how can you say none of those things happened? So uh, I think the Chinese government has dented its credibility substantially with these wavering contradictory stories. But again, it's not going to matter. We've been here before. Things get soothed over. Um, were there any questions that anybody wanted to ask? Dr. Dreyer, I think I'm going to um, exercise my moderator's prerogative and start with a couple questions. We will have time uh, for to draw from questions from the uh, Q&A section, as I mentioned earlier. And, uh, uh, as long as uh, Dr. Dreyer is willing, um, we're hoping to go over actually for maybe 15 minutes and stop closer to uh, 1.15 Montana time or mountain time rather than um, right at one o'clock. So I hope most of you can stay a little bit longer today. Um, so Dr. Dreyer, uh, you've given a very clear exposition of something that I was paying, and I think I suspect none of us were paying much attention of at all, China's spy surveillance program, uh, what, what people are now referring to as uh, its near space uh, balloon program. Near space meaning above, obviously, where commercial aircraft fly, uh, but far below uh, the, where a satellite might be. Um, and I'll also answer the question I had, which is why, why spy balloons? Um, uh, aren't aren't we getting information from our satellites that might even be better? Well, I, uh, I guess not, actually. The nature of the balloons allow that. I'd like you actually, though, to speak more broadly about China's surveillance program beyond just balloons. What are some of the key areas where we know uh, the Chinese uh, surveillance program is being used within the United States? What would be some of the most area, the biggest areas of concern in your mind? Well, they are very good at getting intelligence from a huge number of sources. And 
One of them, of course, is the good old human to human, what's called human in the intelligence community. And uh, sometimes these are pretty innocent. There are people who just like to talk. And uh, they often don't realize who's listening. This is one of the first things they tell you in the intel when you join the intelligence community. Never assume there isn't someone listening, it would be it your cab driver or something like that. And then there is the the honey trap, where you uh, it's it's usually a, an attractive young woman who uh, attaches herself to a uh, a male in a position of power with security clearances. And it has been alleged that this is what happened with Eric Swalwell, who just happened to be head of the intelligence com com committee in the House of Representatives. He swears that he gave her no classified information. And uh, uh, Nancy Pelosi, who was then speaker, uh, backed him on this. He has been taken off the intelligence community com committee, uh, which doesn't look good. But as I say, nothing's been proven, but there's certainly a lot of things that look odd, put it that way. So that's one way of collecting intelligence. Another is that we are a very open source community in the United States. There is scarcely you can't anything you can't get on the internet if you really try. And uh, the Chinese spies are very good at it. Another, the third way is influence operations. The Chinese have what they call united front tactics. And that is they work through various entities. There are friendship associations. And there are uh, work through the Chinese diaspora, not just in the United States, but in Australia and New Zealand. And uh, uh, I think the United States is a very gullible, naive place, but New Zealand goes as one worse. They naturalized a gentleman without checking his naturalization credentials. And he, he was later elected to parliament where he was given high level security clearances. And it was subsequently discovered that he, his previous position in China had been as a cyber instructor for the People's Liberation Army. His name is Yang Chen. <laughs> so uh, that's even more naive than we are. And in a, a third case, a gentleman in Australia named Sam Dastyari, who was an immigrant from Iran, got elected to the Australian parliament. And he was discovered to be taking money from a, another gentleman named Huang Shangmo, who it seems was, he's a wealthy Australian, uh, a Chinese dwelling in Australia who became wealthy through contracts with the Chinese government. And you see the Chinese government gives him lucrative contracts and he then donates a lot of money to Sam Daschari and Sam Daschari's political party and then that party takes China's position on various international matters. Do you see what I mean? So uh, in yet another case, and this one is in the United States, there was a uh, governor who was about to give a speech on something and a prominent member of the Chinese American community, I believe this was in Illinois, and she came to him and said, Governor, we know you're a really busy man, so we've taken the liberty of writing this draft speech for you. And the draft speech, of course, mouthed China's policy positions. And in this case, it was caught and the speech was never made. But you see, there are all kinds of ways to do this. And the Chinese have been very, very clever at it. Another thing they do is they look for mid-level technologies. In other words, you don't go for the latest nuclear warhead, although they were able to snatch that as well as the Cox Commission's report of 2012 indicated they had. But in a lot of cases, these are mid-level technology. So they are um, 
night vision goggles or something like that. And uh, they may also have civilian military uses. And so the surveillance isn't as careful as it would be about nuclear missiles, for example. And they get a lot that way. Uh, I have a, an acquaintance who spent 25 years with DIA researching this, and he often compares the Chinese technique to the thousand grains of sand. In other words, they will send, not actually a thousand, but many people, all of, each one of whom collects information on a very tiny matter, and then they put the sand, the grains of sand into a jar again, and it makes a coherent whole. You, you see what I mean? And uh, another thing is the close cooperation in China between the civilian and the military sector. And I know we talk a lot about cooperation between our defense industries and the intelligence community, but uh, as we used to say in my native Brooklyn, you ain't seen nothing yet. And in the case of China, there is actually a law telling civilian entities that they must cooperate with military pleas for information. China has also what they call national champion industries. And these would be industries in critical sectors. One of them would be energy. Another one would be mining. And <laughs> these companies are subsidized. They're theoretically private companies, but they are subsidized by the central government. So for example, uh, you are a Dutch corporation and you want to bid on an oil field and you have shareholders you're responsible to. So you try to get the most competitive bid you can mm -hmm in order to get that oil field. The Chinese government subsidizes one of the, its companies to put in a much higher bid. And so it gets the oil field. Now, this isn't a foolproof way because if the price of oil goes zipping down, you've lost money. But most of the time it works. Another area where they've got a virtual monopoly was rare earths. I don't know how much you know about that, but there are 17 of these and they're not really rare. They're all over the place. Some countries have more than others. But what happened was the United States outsourced its production. And so the something like 80 to 90%, depending on whose statistic you believe, of rare earths are processed in China. Now, what does that mean? That means if you do something the Chinese government doesn't want, it can withhold rare earths. They actually threatened to do this with Japan in 2010. And Again, I don't know how close you, closely you follow this, but in early September 2010, a Chinese fishing boat rammed not one, but two Japanese Coast Guard vessels. And the Japanese caught the whole thing on videotape. There's no, you know, not one of these he said, she said situations. And the Japanese, they let sailors, the fishermen, go, but they were going to put the captain on trial for destroying state sovereignty. Sounds good so far. And the Chinese government said, nope, you're not going to put him on trial. That was our territorial waters. Because remember, that's contested territory, which Japan happens to be in charge of uh, since 1884. And the, uh, the Chinese then said to the Japanese, okay, you're not going to give him up we've decided not to sell you rare earths anymore. Now, why is that important? 
because rare earths are an absolutely necessary part of the catalytic converters in Japanese cars. And as all know, the Japanese sell a lot of cars. And if they can't get the rare earths, they're in trouble. Now, as the Japanese said, this is a clear violation of WTO, World Trade Organization rules. We're going to take you to court. The problem with making the WTO rules work is it generally takes three years or, or more for them to render a ruling. And by that time, you wouldn't have any rare earths anymore. Now, as it turned out, it didn't happen, but it alerted the world to just how easily these very well thought out Chinese plans could hold parts of the rest of the world hostage. Yes, I, we actually right now in the state of Montana where I am in the Mansfield Center is located are uh, at sort of at the center of a growing state's uh, concern about uh, adversarial nations and read China in this case um, uh, buying up agricultural land. So uh, the US Senator from Montana, John Tester is actually sponsoring uh, legislation that would uh, block Chinese ownership or, or and some other nations as well. Um, uh, ownership of critical infrastructure and agricultural land. So it's a very real concern uh, here as well. Um, uh, turning to another part of the world that you are very knowledgeable about in an area of your research, Taiwan. Uh, Taiwan announced over the weekend that they have had multiple uh, spy, Chinese spy balloon flights over the island. Uh, we all know China is a very much a critical target of Chinese espionage, given the relationship between the two places and China's desire to uh, take Taiwan back under its control. I'm interested how Chinese espionage in Taiwan and perhaps in the larger Indo-Pacific affects the United States, given our very strong relations uh, with Indo-Pacific countries, including with Taiwan, which also happens to be a major recipient of US weapons. How does that affect, how does espionage affect that uh, for us here in the US? Well, uh, unfortunately, Taiwan has been, Taiwan's intelligence operations have been effectively infiltrated by Chinese intelligence. And so this is very difficult. I one Chinese, and this is not recently, it's maybe 10 years ago, a Chinese general said to his US counterpart, go ahead, sell Taiwan all the advanced weapons you want, because we'll have the, the plans next day. Of course, he was exaggerating. It isn't going to be next day. But nonetheless, this is a concern for the United States. And the huge majority of Taiwan citizens want nothing to do with, except for business, with the People's Republic of China. They do not want to be part of the People's Republic of China. The Chinese are always saying, uh, Taiwan has been part of China since time immemorial. This is poppycock, and it is not. And it has certainly not been part of the People's Republic of China for a single day. And uh, the United States is in a very sticky position here because Henry Kissinger, desperate for an agreement with the People's Republic of China back in 1972, because he perceived that China would be an ally against the Soviet Union, uh, agreed with the Chinese to something called the Shanghai Communique. And in it, it said that Chinese on both sides of the Taiwan Strait agree that there is but one China. The United States acknowledges this position. Well, there are a couple of things wrong with that. First of all, most of the people on the other side of the Taiwan Strait don't consider themselves Chinese. They consider themselves Taiwanese. And second, the United States did not say it agreed with China. It said it acknowledged the Chinese position. And in diplomatic relations, this is there is a big gap between those, those two words. Those words were chosen carefully. Now, 
the Chinese government has sought to, to interpret the United States acknowledge as the United States agrees. And that's been a sore point ever since. Now, Taiwan is a democracy. The United States says frequently it supports other democracies. In fact, our, our support of Israel is very heavily premised on the fact that Israel is a democracy. And we can scarcely let that go. Another reason is strategic. Taiwan occupies a very strategic position in the ocean. And uh, the Chinese defense analysts have said Taiwan is the buckle in the belt hemming China in from the Blue Pacific. And if we could only take Taiwan, then we would, among other things, get access to a really excellent Taiwanese port called Kaohsiung, one of the top busiest ports in the world. And we'd be halfway to the, the, the Blue Pacific. And they talk a lot about a weapon they've developed that could hit Guam. Guam is US territory. So we're very uncomfortable with that. Another reason that we are uncomfortable is our ally, and in this case, this is a treaty ally, Japan. The, let me get this right, uh, the southernmost island of Japan is very close to the northernmost island of Taiwan. It is said that on a clear day, you can see from one to the other. I have acquaintances who say they've been trying to get that clear day for years, but in any case, it is very close. And what this means is that, well, first premise, China and Japan don't really get along. You may have noticed that. And this goes way back into history. And and they're not, they don't get along now either. And so Japan worries that if China takes over Taiwan, Japanese territorial waters will be smack up against Chinese territorial waters. And they don't like this idea at all. So uh, we want to defend Taiwan because it's a democracy. We want to defend it because we believe in our own Declaration of Independence. It's in our Woodrow Wilson 17 points. Uh, you shouldn't have to be part of a country when you don't want to be. And for strategic reasons, we must defend Taiwan. And there's been a lot of, because China has been encroaching steadily on Taiwan, sending these balloons over and overflying Taiwan airspace and so on and so forth, is there gonna be an invasion? And we don't know. I suspect Xi Jinping himself doesn't know. And that is why we keep warning him, don't do it. Uh, CSIS in Washington, the Center for Strategic and International Studies recently did a series of war games in which they use something I didn't know existed before. It's called a 20-sided die. I always thought dice had only six sides a piece. But you know, what did people do before Google? I looked up 20-sided die, and by God, you can buy one for $3.67 from Amazon. Shipping is more, but then Amazon charges a lot for shipping. But the idea is CSIS tossed these this die many, many times under different scenarios. And they came up with, if there is a war over Taiwan, the United States will win, but it's going to be extremely costly. And I was unhappy at the way they worded it because it sounded as if they were saying is, it's gonna be extremely costly, so maybe we shouldn't bother. And what I didn't see addressed is, suppose we don't. What are the consequences if we, we decide not to? And you see what I mean. And 
So all wars are costly. World War II was extremely costly. The United States won, but I don't even know how many millions of people died. But we came out on top. And that was not a bad thing. I don't think most of us would like living under a Nazi government or the Japanese militarists. So again, I just wonder how people will interpret this. So I think we probably just have time for two more questions from the audience. I wanted to make sure to ask some from, get some from the audience in as well. So if you could um, keep that in mind, we probably have just about five minutes maximum left for these two questions. So the first one was, um, do we know uh, what sort of intelligence the Chinese may have been gathering or trying to gather from the Chinese spy balloon that flew over the United States? And then a big one, which I think is a very interesting question, does China share this intelligence with any other nations? And who might, who might they be? Okay, um, the, the first question was, do we know where the China, what intelligence may have been gotten from this balloon, right? Yeah, and, yes. Uh, the Chinese are saying, well, you know, these weather data and things like that. And um, wind shifts, temperatures, things like that. And that could be true. Uh, I also am a big fan of Netflix. And I've been watching something called Shooter. And I noticed that whenever the snipers are taking focusing on a target, they have to take the wind from what direction it's coming into consideration. And as somebody who knows about spy things more than I do said, these enable the collecting power to devise algorithms for the best plan of attack. So in other words, it's weather data but it's more than just innocent weather data. It's not like, okay, it's gonna be colder, so I'll put on a sweater sort of thing. And so uh, your second question was- I was gonna say weather data gathered apparently near one of three uh, ICBM yes, silo yes. bases in the United yeah, States. Good point. Western Air Force yeah. Space. Yes, the second question was, does China share this information that they glean with other nations? or other I would entities. imagine probably not. And if so, it would be shared only very selectively. So they would say, all right, Russia needs to know this. And in return, Russia, what do we get from you? The Chinese are very transactional about that, which they should be. Uh, it's the better part of prudence. And maybe Pakistan as well. Yes. Oh, okay. You're, you're last one. question. Yeah, For our last mention. question, I'm going to challenge you uh, one minute to answer. Are, are we now in a second Cold War? One minute? Yes. There, that was only 10 seconds. We yes, are definitely we are. in a second Cold War. And just as with the Cold War with the Soviet Union, there were ups and downs. And it was only when the Soviet Union became bankrupt, that the Cold War ended. And there are very indications that China is declining. Population is going down, the growth rate is going down. Some of it is due to COVID, but not all of it by any means. The environment is continues to deteriorate at an alarming rate. And uh, uh, now, just before you get complacent here, uh, a reputable political scientist, Hal Brands, has predicted that countries often can become more dangerous because they see themselves declining and they want to attack before the decline, the definitive decline sets in. So comport yourselves accordingly, comrades, and watch out. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Dreyer. This has been an absolutely fascinating and illuminating conversation today. Uh, I'm glad we got through our technical glitches and had an opportunity to go over a little bit here so that we could hear from you. Although I would have liked to have continued this conversation for another hour. Unfortunately, we'll not be able to do that. Thank you to the audience for uh, bearing with us uh, till the end here. 
and and I'm sure it was absolutely worthwhile. Thank you so much, Dr. Dreyer. I'm going to hand it over to my colleague at the Mansfield Center, uh, Tegan Avery. Now, thank you. And I just, think, thank you, thank you, Tegan, for bearing with me through all of these iterations. <laughs> Yes, absolutely. Thank you, Dr. Dreyer, for a wonderful discussion today. I certainly learned a lot. And thank you, Tiff, for moderating and helping us all learn. Um, and for, from the Mansfield Center, thank you, everyone, for attending today. And we'd like to draw your attention to two upcoming dialogues that we have scheduled. The first is March 1st. We will host a virtual conversation with Harvard professor David Gergen and Washington Post editor Michael Duffy. That will be online at 7 p.m. And then on March 6th, we will host an exclusively in-person event with past dialogue presenters, Belinda Lake and Ed Goez. And that will be hosted at the University of Montana University Center Theater. So please sign up for those events and you can look to the chat to support us. And if you enjoyed today's discussion, you can be notified about future events at our second link in the chat. So thank you so much for joining today. Thank you again, Tiff and Dr. Dreyer, and thank you, Rachel Tyndall, for providing interpretation for us today. Um, have a great rest of your day.